studios of WDBO in sunny Orlando, Florida, here's talk radio host Joe Kelly's Behind the News podcast, where Joe and his listeners and guests discuss the most important issues of the day, plus the crazy and bizarre stories of the infamous Florida man. Here's Joe Kelly. So glad you're joining us here on a Monday night. It's going to be a busy night, a busy week. I couldn't wait to get back onto the radio on Monday so I could catch up with you guys. I had a busy weekend. I went to the Monster Jam uh, at Camping World Stadium over the weekend. I still am still slightly hard of hearing right now (laughs) from being at Monster Jam. I don't care if it's outdoor event or indoor event. When you go to a Monster Jam, it is loud. It was so loud. And I put out ear protection uh, for both my wife and me to, to take with us. And I forgot it. Not until I was uh, pretty much entering the Camping World Stadium did I realize, oh, I forgot my ear protection. Dog on it. And man, it was uh, super loud and super fun. That's for sure. Uh, My name is Joe Kelly. Joining us now, Channel 9 Eyewitness News uh, Chief Political Correspondent, Christopher Heath. Also the most handsome bearded man on TV (laughs) these days. Chris, how uh, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm watching. Actually, I'm watching my own station right now. And... One of our reporters has interviewed a guy whose name, I kid you not, Johnny Copper Snake. Wow, he That we, is the greatest name ever, right? Is like, he, if you could was, be Johnny Copper Snake today, you would, right? Yes, but is he the bad guy or the good guy? It doesn't matter. You're Johnny Copper Snake. I feel like Johnny <laughs> Copper Snake is definitely going to be a bad guy, though. But yes. I feel like Johnny Copper Snake is a bad guy but does good things. Oh, like an know? anti-hero. I, I, yeah, no, you know. I, I like that. You, I was gonna I was gonna lead off this segment by saying uh, Christopher Heath brings legitimacy to our radio show, but then we're into Johnny Copper Snake. So no, no, yeah, no, 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 no. So uh, tomorrow's gonna be a big day up in Tallahassee as the the governor gives his state of the state ad- address, and that is always timed at the beginning of the first day of the legislative session. Uh, for those of you trying to keep track at home. Uh, for all of our legislative session and special legislative sessions, uh, we p- previously wrapped up. How many special sessions did we have? God, we had, I, I want to say three last that's, year. That's what uh, I want to say was three. Plus the regular, we had a regular session. And then I think, yeah, we had the redistricting one, which also dealt with Disney. Yep. And then we had two more on uh, homeowners insurance. Um, yeah, I mean, for a quote unquote part-time legislature, they're sure up in Tallahassee a lot. Right. Unlike our U.S. Congress, who ostensibly meet year-round, I mean, they, they obviously have long breaks and stuff, uh, but the Florida state legislature, as are most state legislatures, uh, they only meet once a year or in some states just a once every other year. Yeah, I mean, Texas meets for 120 days every two years, which the running joke has always been that they're supposed to meet two days every 120 years. Uh, Florida meets <laughs> 60 days every year. It fluctuates between a winter session or a spring session. If it's an election year, it's a winter session anyway. But yeah, that's that's basically it, 60 days. But as we've seen, you know, a state the size of Florida, you know, we're now the third largest state in the union. There's a lot to do. There's just a lot going on. So 60 days is, you know, often not enough time to get everything done. I wonder I wonder if you could expand upon that. I mean, do you think that that they should expand how many days they work and and is there any effort or is there any discussion about expanding that? To the best of my knowledge, that would require a constitutional amendment yeah. and I, I can't imagine you get sixty percent of Florida voters to go along with you know having them up there more. Um, the governor, obviously, at his leisure, can call them back for a special session. The House and Senate can come together and decide they want a special session. The members themselves can call themselves back for a special session. You know, and then they also have built-in time for you know uh, committee weeks and all this other stuff that they do. So there's a lot of work that happens when they're not actually in session. So, you know, ostensibly, yeah, they're part-time on paper, but... For, for all intents and purposes, they're, they're essentially a full-time legislature already. Back to Christopher Heath, Channel 9 Eyewitness News, uh, chief political reporter. And so why don't you break down for us some of the big items that the state legislature is expected to address this session? Yeah, there's a couple that are going to happen. Um, one is the expansion of permitless carry. It, it got originally called constitutional carry. But that would encompass both open carry and permitless carry. They've kind of pulled it back. It's, it's only permitless carry. So basically, it's concealed carry, but you don't need a permit from the state. So no fingerprinting, no background check. Basically, if you are legally allowed to 
own a weapon in the state of Florida, you can carry it concealed out in public. That is going to happen. That's moving its way through pretty quickly. Uh, and, and, I, and school voucher and expansion hang on, hang, as well. Let, let me ask before you move on to school vouchers, <laughs> let me ask about, about the gun permits. Does, does that yeah. mean for those of us who do have concealed carry permits that the state is going to get rid of the concealed carry permits since they're not so necessary still, anymore? No, they're still necessary. You can still get a concealed carry permit, and that offers you several legal protections that come with having that concealed carry permit. Um, the biggest of which is when you travel to other states, mm. having that concealed carry permit from Florida yeah. allows you in states that also have concealed carry to have a level of reciprocity. Whereas if you're just, you know, concealing, you know, concealed carry without a permit in Florida because it's legal and you go to another state, they may not, you know, Good treat point. you as kindly. So, yep. yeah, it, it gives you a level of protection. And listen, when you've talked, I, I interviewed a, um, a guy who's a, you know, he basically teaches gun safety, and he says, you know, I'm all for this, but he's like, a gun is like any other tool. I, if, if somebody buys a gun, I want them to, you know, go out and learn how to use it responsibly. And so, he, you know, he said, just because you can carry without a permit, go get the training, go spend yep. some time at the range, get to use it. it. It's like anything else. You know, if you buy a set of golf clubs, maybe go get a, hit a couple of buckets of balls to figure out how to use them. He said, you know, it's the same thing. So basically it removes that. If you want to carry concealed, you don't need a permit from the state. So the school voucher program, that this is going to be kind of an, an expansion, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is an expansion of Florida's uh, tax credit scholarship. It's, it's essentially two of the programs out there would be opened up essentially to everybody uh, K-12 provided your family income is less than 185% of the federal poverty limit. I don't know what that number would be off the top of my head, but so there is, there's a means testing for it, but it does open it up to even more kids to be able to take that money and attend a private school. And, um, you know, there's going to be some pushback from obviously, you know, people saying, well, hold on, how do we have accountability for private schools? What does this do for public education? If you're pulling money out of public education, but this is a huge priority for both the speaker and the Senate president as well as the governor. So this, this one's going to happen as well. And Chris, tra transgender issues are going to be discussed this session? Yeah, once again, we're going to have uh, transgender issues come up. Uh, Randy Fine, the representative out of Palm Bay, um, he has filed a bill uh, to prohibit treatments for transgender youth while also banning the state from um, essentially, you know, using tax dollars to pay for adult procedures. Uh, and then Adam Anderson, he's a representative out of, uh, kind of out of the Tampa area. He's filed one that would require K-12 schools to use the pronouns that are assigned to the student at their birth. So you would no longer get to, if you're going to school, use your preferred pronouns. You'd have to use whatever is on your birth certificate. So I guess that's what we're doing. And, and lastly, uh, abortion restrictions. Y you know, it's interesting. I always thought that Florida would certainly have the strictest of abortion restrictions, but there are many, many states that have far stricter restrictions than we do. Uh, in fact, some people are traveling to Florida to get their abortions. If you look at the southeast of the United States, Florida is the most liberal of the states when it comes to abortion restrictions. Um, most of them have banned it outright. Georgia has six weeks. So Florida is kind of a destination for abortion. The big caveat to all of this is that in the past, the Florida Supreme Court has held that Florida's constitutional amendment on privacy covers abortion and basically that the state cannot restrict beyond the initial 27 weeks. Uh, because of privacy concerns. Now, obviously, the Supreme Court has been remade in the last several years. The Florida Supreme Court I'm talking about here, it has been remade in the last several years. Much more conservative court. There is a thought that that court may overturn that previous decision, in which case legislature would have um, much more wide berth to restrict abortion. But until that court case is settled, the legislature is not likely to impose additional restrictions until the Supreme Court weighs in. And lastly, I know I just said lastly before the last one, but this but this one's this one's personal. I saw you 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 did that run. Was it on Saturday? Yes. And what yes. was that? What was that run? It was the best damn race. Yeah, the you're, name of it. Uh, for those who don't know, Chris is an avid runner. And what what length was that? A five k? This was a half marathon. Oh, how did you do? So, I, I finished. It, it, yeah. Wow, the weather was so bad. I mean, yeah. I know you had George Waldenberger on here talking about the weather. I, I blame him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. way too. <laughs> <laughs> it was way too hot. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, you roll the dice. It makes a big difference. Yeah, it absolutely makes a big difference. Yeah. All right, Chris. Always great to catch up with you, buddy. Have a uh, have a great night. And I know you'll be covering the uh, the start of the legislative session as well. Channel Nine Eyewitness News political reporter Christopher Heath, an all around good guy. My name is Joe Kelly. Coming up in a moment, a mysterious launch getting ready out of Cape Canaveral. Hang on, we've got the details coming up. I think most of you guys know that I am a uh, an FAA licensed drone pilot. And as such, I am regularly checking the aviation maps, the aviation apps, the j- just to see what kind of flight restrictions there are and whether or not I can fly my drone in certain locations. And they, they, the FAA establishes uh, what are called uh, TFRs, temporary flight restrictions. And there have been a number of TFRs that have been popping up around Cape Canaveral Space Force Station that are unorthodox. They're not normal TFRs. Uh, I, as, I, as I look to go out to the coast to, to uh, video record with my drone, one of the rocket launches, you know, I know what the TFRs look like. I know how far out into the Atlantic they typically go. I know, I know, uh, you know, what the cone looks like uh, of where the TFR is. But there have been other TFRs that have been popping up just a little south of the Kennedy Space Center. And so I did some looking into this and I found a piece at the drive.com that indicates that the uh, forces out at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station may be on the precipice of launching a hypersonic missile out of Cape Canaveral. Now, it is pretty routine to, to have a known launch with an unknown payload. Uh, when, whenever NASA or the the space center, whenever you know SpaceX or whoever is involved, uh, does something for our uh, you know security agencies, then sometimes the payload will be top secret. We'll have no idea what the payload is, but we're we're very very well informed of the launch. I mean, it's going to happen. You're going to see it. They might as well tell us about it because you you can't hide a launch from the space coast. This is the first I've seen where they're trying to hide a launch, seemingly. Uh, Now, this, of course, could develop into absolutely nothing or it could be something, but it's imminent. It 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 is either going to happen today, tonight, maybe first thing tomorrow. Uh, But according to the drive dot com signs that such a test could uh, come began a couple of days ago when various hazard warnings were posted. The launch window extended throughout the weekend into late Monday afternoon. That's this afternoon. The pattern shown of hazardous areas does not seem to match common orbital launch systems that are a staple of the region. That's what I was telling you about. This is a different looking TFR. In addition, no orbital launchers are scheduled. So why would there be a temporary flight restriction if they don't have a launch scheduled? Subsequent TFRs that, that are common for launch operations have been put in, put in place. There have also been images posted on Twitter showing what appears to be one of the Army's new long-range hypersonic weapons, also known as the nickname Dark Eagle. The Dark Eagle launchers have been erected to the firing position at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. So they have they have previously done some test operations with hypersonic missiles, but unlike China and Russia, we have not launched one. We've been working on it, but we have not launched an actual hypersonic missile. The, the tests that we have done have all been, you know, basically a ground-based or computer models. Uh, but there were some tests done out at Joint Base Lewis-McChord, which is up near, uh, near Seattle. It's up in Washington State. And this potential firing of a hypersonic missile comes just a day before the Air Force Association's Warfare Symposium kicks off tomorrow outside of Denver. So this would certainly be all of the talk at the Air Force Association's Warfare Symposium if we, the United States, launched a hypersonic missile 
So I don't know about you, but if I had a good view of Cape Canaveral of the uh, Space Force Station, I, I don't know, I'm, I'd feel like I want to set up a camera and just have it start rolling just in case. Just in case the uh, the, the hypersonic missile gets launched. Uh, we'll certainly keep an eye on that and let you know if there are uh, any new news there. Laurel, you had mentioned a little while ago about the the Americans that were kidnapped in Mexico. And and I've seen various reports about why they were in Mexico. Uh, some some reports have said a medical condition uh, or a medical procedure. I've seen others say that they're going there for medicines, right? Yeah, so something medical, but we don't know exactly what yet. Now, the first time I went to Mexico, I was surprised to find that what is a prescription in America is not a prescription in Mexico. And I'll give you an example, like amoxicillin. Like if you want amoxicillin in the United States, you have to go to a doctor and get a prescription. If you want amoxicillin in Mexico, you go down to the drugstore and you buy amoxicillin over the counter. You do not need a prescription for it. Now, the rub is when you come back into the United States, you're supposed to have a prescription if you get caught. If you get caught with amoxicillin in the United States, you still have to have a prescription for it. But no one gets caught with amoxicillin in the United States. You know, it's not like they sell it's not like they sell opioids over the counter. They don't do that. But they'll sell uh, you know, antibiotics and stuff like that. So they might have just been in Mexico to purchase uh, cheaper and you know cheaper medicines, frankly, and without uh, without a prescription. I'm Joe Kelly. We will continue coming up. Stay with us. Broadcasting live from the Florida Freedom Zone. That's why you are an award winner. We are listening to your show. Why? Because we love it. So there, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Orlando's news and talk with Joe Kelly on WDBO. I'm going to go back to Mexico for just a moment. When I say go back to Mexico, I, I mean I want the topic to go back to Mexico because there's no way in hell I will ever, ever, ever go back to Mexico. Ever. Ever. I have a moratorium on Mexico. Hey, Laurel. Yes. You like Mexico, don't you? I do. And and you've been? And I'm going again. <laughs> <laughs> and might I ask, where in the country are you going? I can't remember. Okay. Some, but it's to a resort. To a resort. Well, I hope you're safe. I hope things are safe there. I will tell you, Mexico is, when when President Trump was quoted as saying that there are S-hole countries, that's one of them. Mexico is one of the S-hole countries. And it, they are so corrupt. The The police are corrupt. The lawmakers are corrupt. Local officials are corrupt. Everybody everywhere is corrupt. It is a, an absolute lawless land. And, I, and I, I really want to emphasize this to any moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas who have kids, uh, maybe high school or college kids that are thinking about going to Mexico for spring break. And, and, and I know that this was a big warning we had to give in Texas all the time. When I lived in Texas and I was in Texas radio, uh, we would always tell people, don't, you know, it's, I know it's close. It's exotic. You want to go across the border. But Mexico is so dangerous. Kidnappings, murders, uh, rapes, uh, dr- of course, drugs, drugs aplenty in Mexico. Uh, and then, you know, in, in Mexico, it's not just it's not just Mexicans. I mean, they're there. That is a major hub through which people travel to get to the United States. Um, and, and a lot of those people are, you know, gang dealers, uh, gang members, drug dealers, cartel members. I mean, it is so incredibly dangerous. And I'll, I'll share with you a couple of experiences that I've had in Mexico, which is why I will never go back. Uh, the first of which was the first time <laughs> the, fr- <laughs> the first time I went to Mexico, I just got a really bad case of Montezuma's revenge. <laughs> and, and when I got back to the United States, I, I vowed at that point for for every day, for every day I am stuck on this toilet is a year of a of a moratorium for me going back to Mexico. So I had a 14-year moratorium on Mexico, which means I spent two weeks on the toilet. It was horrible. It was so bad. So I just I hated going back to Mexico. But my my wife at the time, she she really wanted to go and and we went and and this wasn't an example of danger, but it was just an example of the the con man atmosphere that you have in Mexico. 
So we we had boarded. Well, well let me back up. We were sitting on a beach in Ixtapa, uh, Ixtapa, Mexico. It's on the west coast, and we were sitting on a beach. And some some guy comes up to us and says, hey, do you guys want to go on a fishing charter? And, I, and I'm like, yeah, I'd love to go on a, actually on a fishing charter. And he pulls out this binder and he shows us all these pictures of these, this big, beautiful fishing boat and and this big crew and everything. And, I, and I, I knowing how easy it is to get scammed, I said, look, I need to know, is that the boat we're going on? And he said, yes, absolutely. That's the boat we're going on. I said, and are you going to be the captain on the boat? And he said, absolutely. I'm going to be the captain on the boat. I said, okay, if, if, if I find out otherwise, then I'm not going. And so the next morning we showed up right on time, right where we were supposed to be. That dude was nowhere to be found. The boat was incredibly different, much smaller, didn't even have a radio and I was like, I'm not getting on that boat and I'm not going fishing on that boat. And then after having a discussion with my, my wife about it, we're like, all right, look, what's the worst that could happen, right? What's the worst that could happen? So we get on this boat and there's literally just the three of us. It's the skipper who doesn't speak English and the two of us who don't speak Spanish. Well, we're not fishing very long before we hooked a, a nine foot sailfish and reeled it in. And I made it abundantly clear that I had no need for a nine-foot sailfish and that I wanted to let it go. But before I could attempt to explain it to the boat captain, he had already pulled out a baseball bat and beaten it bloody. And I was so frustrated by that. I was, I was really upset by that. And then at that point, I was getting seasick because it was such a small boat. Uh, so I said, fine, you know what? Just take us back. We're done. Take us back. And then he takes us back to Zewantanejo. Now, do you remember the name of the city I told you we left from? Does anybody, do you remember the name of the city I told you we left from? Not that one. We left from Ixtapa. Right. And he took us back to Zewantanejo. Now, do you know what Zewantanejo is famous for? No, but I know the name, so that can't be good. Well, you know the name because it is the place where Red has to go catch up with Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption. Oh, okay. Right. Zewan Tanejo. In fact, yes. one day it was raining really hard and that we all of our outdoor activities got canceled. We went inside to go watch a movie and all they had was Shawshank Redemption uh, that just runs on a constant loop. And so we get off the boat and I've got this nine foot sailfish from, from the end of its tail to the tip of its nose. And we string it up on a stringer and I take pictures with it and all that stuff. And then the guy's like, okay, do you want your fish? Well, hang on a second. You've dropped us off in Zewan Tanejo. This is not even the city we're staying in. How are we supposed to get back to Ixtapa? The guy says, we'll take a taxi. Why the hell didn't someone explain that to me before we took off? I mean, I just, I, the whole thing was a scam. And I said, how am I going to get... How am I going to get this nine-foot sailfish back to Extapa? I'm going to put it in the back of a taxi cab where it's sticking out both doors? It's crazy. You know, I saw this story earlier in the week that a couple of dudes in Nebraska shot and killed a bald eagle that they they planned on eating. They were going to eat this bald eagle. And, it, and it, the, when the story first came out, it basically just said two men shot and killed a bald eagle. The, the facts were pretty slim. Well, we know a lot more now about this story, and it is getting more interesting. Nebraska officials say that a pair of migrants, uh, this is the word that was used at uh, foxnews.com, migrants, they're, they're, they're illegal immigrants. They're in the country illegally from Honduras. They shot and killed a bald eagle, a protected animal, and, of course, the national emblem, the symbol of the United States, uh, with the intention of killing the bird. The two Honduran nationals, Ramiro Hernandez Taziking, and he's 20, and Domingo Zetino Hernandez, he's 20, uh, they, they were cited for unlawful possession of the eagle. And then one of the guys was cited also for not having a driver's license. Neither of them speak English, and their only form of identification was documents from the Honduran consulate. The migrants were arrested, but have since been released. And the federal government could have kept the pair in jail, 
But the local authorities keep calling the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the federal agency that brings charges against people for violating the 1940 Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Phone calls to the Fish and Wildlife Service have gone unanswered. So these two guys aren't going to get charged. They, they've already been let go. They're illegal immigrants. They shot and killed a bald eagle. And they were going to cook and eat the bird. They didn't get around to cooking or eating the bird, uh, which is why they were charged with or cited for unlawful possession of an eagle, which is which is a misdemeanor. It's not even that big of a crime. And so I, I, I asked myself, I wonder... Actually, I was having a discussion with a colleague about this, and the colleague said, is that a common crime? Is that a common crime that people get charged with killing eagles? And I said, well, I I know certain cases where people have gone to jail for, for simply possessing the feathers of an eagle. Even if they were to find it on the ground, people have been charged with stuff like that. And so just to make sure I was clear on this, I Googled. When was the last time somebody was charged for killing a bald eagle? And there are endless stories. Doverman sentenced for killing bald eagle. That's 2022. Four arrested in killing of eagles and other protected birds. That's May of 2009. Virginia man pleads guilty to killing a bald eagle. Uh, That's 2017. Um, Utah man sentenced for killing 10 bald and golden eagles. A uh, feather, feather from slaughtered bald eagle lands an L.A. man in prison for two years. Just the feather. So I guess we could argue whether or not it's appropriate, inappropriate to shoot and kill eagles. Of course, the law says it's not appropriate. And I can understand that these two men were probably very hungry And perhaps they didn't understand that that is a protected species. But ignorance of the law is no excuse. You come to our country illegally and then you proceed to break more laws like driving without a driver's license. If he doesn't have driver's license, I guarantee you he doesn't have insurance. And the fact that the federal agencies, the Biden administration couldn't care less about holding these two men responsible for killing a bald eagle or for being in the country illegally or for driving without a driver's license or for driving without insurance is appalling. It's outrageous. I I am more outraged at the Fed's inaction against these two men than I am outraged at these two men killing an eagle. Frankly, with some of the convictions, I mean, sending a man to jail for having for possessing an eagle feather to me is a bit much. We've got such prison overcrowding. Let's not put people in jail for simply possessing a feather of an eagle. But these two men shot and killed one again of all the crimes they committed in that act. Shooting and killing the eagle to me is the lesser of the crimes. Being in the United States illegally is the bigger of the crimes. Because had they not violated that law, have they, had they not committed that crime, they wouldn't have been here to shoot an eagle. They wouldn't have been here to drive without a license. They wouldn't have been here to drive without insurance. Heaven only knows what other laws they're breaking. It is outrageous that the feds are ignoring this. My name is Joe Kelly. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. 